Lawrence. Good afternoon, Reading. Um, I don't know how long I follow that, um, but I try. Um, I've been working with uh, Laura Ann for about five years, um, and we're often told that to develop a, an ecosystem, we need typically about 10 years. So I thought I would take a look at my journey in using Laura Wan, and that's in the built environment, and look at the kind of projects I've been involved with, helping customers deliver, things I delivered myself. Um, and that's in the smart building uh, space. And I don't know anybody caught this um, announcement from Semtech uh, a couple of weeks ago. This is a new reference design. Um, and interestingly, they make a distinction between a smart building and a smart home. And I've worked in both sectors, and they're very, very, very different beasts. Um, the nearest a smart home gets to a smart building, if you're in super prime properties that have a plant room the size of something like this. So what I want to do is, is look at some of the systems and services that you'll find in a large commercial building. So a commercial building being a hospital, an office block. And we'll look at those systems, how you integrate to them, and how LoRa is actually being used in other contexts in the built environment. So, what does the systems and services look like in a building? Well, we've heard this term BMS. It stands for Building Management System. It's a complete misnomer, but the term was sort of coined about 50 years ago, and that's kind of what the, the, those that coined it thought you would need to run your building. So what does a building management system do? It delivers air tempered to a particular temperature, a typical level of humidity for a number of people. Um, and typically, it often means an air change every X number of hours and or, more modernly, a constant air volume. So that's what a building management system does. It doesn't manage the building. It manages the HVAC, as we call it. Lighting. <coughs> Um, I think Tony mentioned uh, Terminal 5. Um, there are over 100,000 addressable lights in Heathrow Terminal 5. They're all on a twisted pair bus. They're all controlled. Um, they synchronize uh, with a, something that's called a head end, um, to give it its correct term. This thing up here in the top end. And we've all interfaced with lighting systems at a sensory level. Typically, we're working a way. The lights go out, and we have to wave our arm just to wake the occupancy sensor up. And yes, we've all tried to get through the turnstiles and, and have been rejected. Um, so we've got our physical security here, um, badges, gates. And these, again, may or may not get surfaced. They're typically all siloed. So up in the top-hand corner, it looked like uh, it's an integrated system, it certainly isn't. Um, whereas actually Heathrow Terminal 5 is um, because they have issues between air side and passenger side. And then we have our safety system, which are pretty dumb by and large, a standalone. Uh, and those are the kind of sort of core systems that you would have probably had some interaction with. When the fire alarm goes here, where is the exit? Where do we muster? Does anybody know? Do we know? No. So if it goes off, I think I'm heading to the door like you. And finally, we've, we've heard metering mentioned. So these are the kind of systems that basically are in, in most commercial buildings you'll find of a given size. Probably what you're not aware of is the kind of services facility managers use to operate a building like this. And again, some of the terminology used gives an indication of when they were conceived. CAFAM stands for Community Aided Facility Management. So this is when basically you had a PC in the office and you ran the building. So what a CAFAM system is now, typically it's, it's cloud-based and it's provided as a service. So a CAFAM system, for example, will allow you to schedule your routine tasks. Those routine tasks are clean the stairwell, clean the toilet, service the boiler, check the aircon. The other type of tasks you have in that environment are what we call reactive tasks. So the lights failed in the corridor. You pick the phone up, you phone the help desk, they log a ticket. So that's a reactive task. And I'll come back to that later on when I talk about some of the integration points. 
And then a more recent development is what we call integrated workplace management. So that includes the CAFM feature, but it also allows you to manage an estate if you're a large owner of buildings. And that, again, is a, a cloud-based service delivered to the FM to, to run the building. And again, that's another touch point around integration. Okay, so where's Laura being used? I think you've already heard about a number of people today where it is. Compliance, Legionella, that's, that's certainly been solved with wireless sensors for some time. Uh, and again, it's been solved well with, with Laura. What we're starting to see now is whereas most of those solutions are sensor-based, people are now starting to actuate. So they're starting to deploy Class C devices in a building. In that case, they're actually opening a valve, uh, letting the water flow, um, and then taking a temperature measurement. Why is that interesting? Well, if you have uh, a student accommodation block, say with uh, accommodation for 3,000 students, you have to test each faucet, or e.g. taps, to each, each shower. Some universities, some hospitals have full-time teams going around measuring, recording, and reporting. So if you can automate that in a way that demonstrates um, that you are compliant, and you can do that with a single actuated device, e.g. you send a signal, you open a valve, you've got one temperature sensor making a measurement as opposed to multiple temperature sensors at multiple points, you've got a cost reduction. Again, we've heard about occupancy management, um, and typically uh, this consists of either people counters or the small sensor you place under a desk or in a meeting room. Um, people are using this in uh, many different situations. And one statistic I came across on a project, um, the reason why they put this workplace management system in um, was simply because to equip a new floor in a building was going to cost them a million pounds. And like a lot of building owners, they were convinced with their eyes that actually their occupancy pattern meant that actually we weren't utilising our desks. So things that you find when you start collecting the data is that hot desking day, worst day of the week, Wednesday. Um, usually the first floor is always occupied, um, but people don't know that there are other desks available. So what you start to see now is a near real-time view of um, availability of desks, typically on a monitor, on a floor as you walk in. But one of the funniest things I, I heard was uh, when a uh, workspace analyst was describing to somebody that the workforce consisted of, put it mildly, twats. And I thought, what? Twats? Yes, that basically means they work Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So it's a vernacular term used in workplace analytics to describe the fact that you have this distribution. It's pretty common. So the other area, and again, people have talked about this, they've talked about monitoring large assets. Um, and we've already touched upon, um, with one of the rapid talks, on fire door monitoring. So post Grenfell um, brought around a cultural change in the facility management space. Um, and suddenly FMs got worried about fire doors being left open. We've all wandered around buildings. We've seen a fire extinguisher keeping the door open. That now, post Grenfell, is actually quite unacceptable. So they're cognizant of that. So not only are we getting changes in LoRaWAN technology, changes in laws, we're actually getting changes in working practice, which then requires us to um, uh, deploy sensor-based solutions to, to overcome those. Um, I think this is the ELSIS Mini, which I've got in a prototype form, but hopefully we'll all have our hands on it soon. Service on demand. This is an interesting one. This is a LoRa sensor developed for Swiss Post. And effectively, you know, you're in a, in this case, I think you're in a small kitchen area and you want um, uh, it cleaned or there's something missing. You press the button, it sends a signal and basically the FM team then are required to react 
They're required to react. So how do they do that? So if you look at our LoRaWAN stack and at the top end, we've left the, the, the LoRaWAN server and we're going to basically, at the app server level, here, we're just basically posting um, a request to the CAFM or the Integrated Workplace Management System to raise an alert or a reactive task. And this is a growing uh, trend in, in some buildings uh, where it's called service on demand. So it can be anything. The AV system's not working. So what I want to talk about now um, is a project um, I got involved with about four years ago for a major museum in London. And it's indicative of, I think, the change in the LoRaWAN ecosystem I've seen over the last four years. So it was quite a straightforward requirement at first. We needed to measure additional temperature and humidity in the gallery space. Um, they had a brand new plant room built, and beneath it was a, a display area. They had a, an artifact that had um, never left the Vatican before, and one of the uh, pieces of equipment in the, the plant, uh, plant room was leaking within inches of this priceless artifact. So could we do leak detection? Yes, we could. And we, again, we've heard about metering. They had a, a large set of um, uh, motors that they wanted us to manage and get energy data from. Fine. So standard LoRaWAN architecture. Off we go. Then the next thing they asked us for, can we integrate to their people counter? And we thought, well, we were providing a sensor solution. I think Ali's alluded to this. Quite often when you're going in to solve a problem in the built environment and you can demonstrate you have a solution, they start to say, well, can you do this? And part of the problem here is that we've heard this term building management system. What we don't have is visualization across all these different types of systems in the built environment. So yes, we could do that. Um, the, the, peop the people counter counts locally, posts to a, a cloud platform. It's got a public API. We can consume it. We can join this data set from the LoRaWAN system and the people counter. Now, the next one was, can you get temperature and humidity data from the BMS? And we said, yes, there's a little device. We can put that onto the BMS network. We can extract that information. We can post that to the cloud. So we've got this joint up uh, view that you're looking for. And that's really when our problem started. Problem started because the BMS vendor said, well, if you're going to take temperature data from our system, we want your temperature data. Um, and so we negotiated, we negotiated, and in the end, we could not agree. We proposed an on-premise solution because um, we couldn't do cloud integration. And what we needed to do was talk the protocol of a building management system. They talk a, a language called BACnet. Uh, they can also talk to metering systems called Modbus. We offered up both. And in the end, contractually, we couldn't agree with them to actually do this piece of integration. So project stopped. And that was four years ago. Um, and now what I want to look at now is that if I was presented with that same problem today, how would I solve it? Well, <coughs> this is a French company. Um, I don't know how you pronounce it properly. I'm dyslexic. I'll have a go. Camilla Systems. This is a LoRaWAN to Mobbrus bridge. So what I believe is in it is a network server and a protocol converter. And with TTN v3 coming along, we can do an on-premise solution running on a low-cost embedded device. We could uh, run Node-RED as an application server, and we can either talk Modbus or BACnet directly from that. So this is very, very doable today. It wasn't very, very doable four years ago. Now, I just want to step to one side for a moment. I don't know how many of you saw Nicholas Soren's talk at the beginning of the year at the TTN conference. Um, when this slide came up and he said he was quite excited, I, I kind of got excited with him. Um, there's not much information about this other than the details from the workshop. And in the workshop, they used uh, an example that doesn't kind of uh, apply to the use case that I think it can apply to.
but device to device communication. Has anybody seen this? About three, four hands. Anybody doing device to device? One, two. Wow, okay. Right, well, you'll correct me if I'm wrong if I'm going forward because I'm not done much with this. So, as I understand it, with no change to physical um, bill of materials um, and with a firmware update and the standard agreed, we will be able to transmit a packet that simultaneously talks to a device locally and to the LoRa network server. Now, why is that important? Well, in controls market, if I've got a means of doing data to the cloud uh, and an application endpoint and also to a device on, in premises, I don't need an on premises LoRaWAN system. So maybe what that looks like is this. So now I've got my standard LoRaWAN device, it's running, I don't know, V. 105, whatever the stack version of LoRaWAN needs to be. I'm talking as I normally am, uh, through my gateway, up into the uh, network server and into the application layer. And at the same time, I'm talking to a simple device that takes the same measurement, in this case temperature and humidity, and posting it directly to the BMS. So that, so for those who are doing device to device, have I got this right or have I got this wrong? Question. No? Yes? No? Maybe, possibly. I don't know. Remains to be seen. And this, I don't know. Um, I'm not too sure what's meant by this symbol, but this is one that Nicholas kept on showing. So this is a combination of the cloud and, and your endpoints. Right, apologies. So, what I want to look at now is, well, um, if we could build a low-cost BMS um, using uh, LoRaWAN, why do we want to do that? And where could we use it? And, and I was sort of asked by the, the guy that ran my local scouts unit um, when my daughter attends, they had a security problem. But I also said, actually, you've got more than security problem. You know, you actually need to control your costs. Your lights stay on when they shouldn't. Your heating doesn't come on when it should. So I started thinking about how we would build a low-cost BMS and why you'd want to build a low-cost BMS and how you'd deliver that using LoRaWAN. Oh, wrong way. So I think a few other speakers alluded to this. I don't know how old that kind of information is. But basically, our, our built environment is very, very inefficient. So the one of the ways which you tackle uh, energy reduction in a built environment, typically, you insulate. Secondly, you regulate. And thirdly, you generate, so you re renewables. And to sort of break that down, these figures are from the, the US. Um, and there are a couple of things to, to be cognizant of here. First of all, energy costs in the building. Who's paying the bill? If the landlord is, he has absolutely no incentive to reduce your energy consumption because he just passes the bill directly onto the tenant. If a tenant's paying, they're much more up for it. So what I thought I would do is I'd go through some of this in terms of the type of um, uh, area that can really be addressed by LoRaWAN at the moment and see how we might solve that with physical equipment you can buy today. So um, MSC88 have a nice little plug top device so we can actually switch off things that shouldn't be left on overnight. Um, they also have a small uh, little actuator goes in a, a back box. Um, Nordic Automation have a Class C LoRaWAN device talks directly to Dali. So if you do happen to have a building with a Dali lighting system in it, you have a direct LoRaWAN interface to that. Now, heating. Um, I've forgotten the name of these guys, but um, I did a project several years ago with a different RF technology in a college not too far from here where I did cast iron radiator valves, and we had to break into them. 
What I would sorely like to see in the LoRaWAN space is a thermoelectric radiator valve, battery powered, um, with LoRaWAN in it. Um, open, I think um, there were, was an initiative by one of the open TRB project to support LoRaWAN, but I don't think anything ever came from that. And then finally, um, one manufacturer is currently doing an IR blaster, which will basically allow you to um, turn what we call the split on and off. Split being the cooling's outside and the delivery of cool or warm air is inside. And that's what we refer to as a split. So those are the kind of loads that you can actually control today and soon with, with LoRa. So I was going to do a demo, but um, demo uh, um, probably ought to be maybe shown in the workshop outside um, because I couldn't get it to work here. So this is an interesting device. It's a Class C device. It's made by Ursulink, who are a Chinese uh, manufacturer. It, it's both a sensor. Uh, it's got digital inputs. It's got analog inputs. It's an actuator. So I can drive a lamp. I can drive a valve. It's also a controller. So it's a different breed of device. So in it, um, I can react locally to a change of state on the input, and I can drive the output. Uh, I can send that, that information over LoRaWAN, but I don't need to be connected for it to actually operate. Um, it's got a built-in um, day of week scheduler, um, and being a Class C device, I can drive its outputs as I choose to. So, how do we go about building a, a BMS light with LoRaWAN? And I'm now talking about the application layer. I'm also talking about Class C devices because typically with actuation, you want to respond at a given time, but it could be done with Class A devices as well. We need an occupancy schedule. One of the things that you'll see in a BMS system or a lighting management system is when are folk going to be in. One of the things we could quite easily do with a temperature sensor located inside a building is what we called optimum start or optimum cooling. What does that mean? With a bit of analytics and a bit of learning, you can work out how long it takes to you heat your room. So anybody that's got a nest, uh, or uh, I'm not too sure what the British gas one is uh, called, um, hive, I think. What they'll do, they'll actually look at the profile of a given room and work out how long it takes to heat or cool by a degree C and then you can extrapolate. Oh. So the other thing you can do quite simply, if you know that the room is occupied, um, you can knock um, what we call a set point back. Um, what does that mean? So instead of going up to the wall and turning the stack because you know you're leaving, you can do that. So after, say, half an hour of inoccupancy, you can just knock the set point back. So summary, um, the majority of our built environment is done. So there's scope here, the scope to do it at a local level. You can do it certainly at home. Smaller builders in the EU tend to use radiator systems for hot water control. They use splits and fans for cooling. Um, and we can simply build LoRaWAN solutions and a light version system. We're not delivering conditioned air. What we really need also is a LoRaWAN TRV, not only for the home market, but for the actual industrial market as well. So, some terms, they're there at the end. That's me. I'm pretty sure I'm well under, but given that uh, the previous talk was so good, um, hopefully that's been of some interest to you. Thank you very much, Lawrence. <laughs>